Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It's been a week, but it still gives me goosebumps and brings tears to my eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter and Mrs. Rosalind Carter. President-elect of the United States, Barack H. Obama. to take the oath, Senator? I am. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do I, Barack, solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. That I will execute the office of President to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the, pres the office of President the of the United of States. The office of President of the United States faithfully. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. All the best wishes. workers are no less productive than when this crisis began. Our minds are no less inventive, our goods and services no less needed than they were last week or last month or last year. Our capacity remains undiminished, but our time of standing pat, of protecting narrow interests and putting off unpleasant decisions, that time has surely passed. Starting today, we must pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and begin again the work of remaking America. That distinguished gentleman on the right is Dr. Roscoe Brown, American hero, CUNY prof, fellow host here at CUNY TV, and a friend. He's joining me to talk about being a witness and a part of history. Roscoe is the director of the Center for Urban Education Policy here at CUNY. He's the press president of CUNY's Bronx Community College, and he was a former director of the Institute of Africa Afro-American Studies at NYU, and in 2002, Father of the Year. Roscoe and I are joined by two other witnesses and activists in history. Hazel Dukes is a civil rights worker and advocate for education. She is currently president of the New York NAACP and the former president of the National Organization. She is a well-known member of the New York black community. Also joining us is Wendell Foster. Wendell is the pastor of United Church of Christ. He is a civil rights activist. He was a member of the city council until he got term limited out in 2001. And that district, the 16th uh, councilmatic district, is now represented by his daughter, Helen. 
Welcome all. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to be here, Doug. Roscoe, you're sitting there. Pretty amazing, huh? What are you thinking at that moment? Well, when you're in history or you see history being made, you don't really internalize it until later. I was at the March on Washington in 1963 with my daughter, and I was at Obama swearing in in 2009 with my daughter. That continuity lets me know and lets the world know just how far we have gone. This was a pivotal moment in history. I was very proud to be there, particularly as a Tuskegee Airman, because the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II broke many of the stereotypes about racial inferiority, led to the integration of the military, and have been part of the struggle for so, so many years. And uh, President Obama invited us. He wanted us to be there. We had a great position. You saw it on the TV. Great scene. It was absolutely thrilling, one of the greatest things in my life. And, and in fact, it's before Jackie Robinson. It's before Brown versus the Board of Ed. It's before Rosa Parks. It's before Martin Luther King. It's before Jesse Jackson. I mean, the road traveled is a long one, but you were there at the beginning. I was there at the beginning, but I must say that my hero when I was a young man was Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson helped to break some of those barriers. My dad worked in Roosevelt's Black Cabinet with Mary McLeod Bethune. Mm. Those are the people on whose shoulders I stand, and I believe that Barack and many of these younger African Americans stand on the Tuskegee Airmen's shoulders, on Jackie Robinson's shoulders, on Roy Wilkins' shoulders, and on even Wendell Foster's okay. shoulders. Okay. <laughs> Hazel, where were you that day, last Tuesday, and what what were you doing and what were you thinking almost at the moment that we see Roscoe? Well, I was in uh, the area, in you know, on the mall, in the yellow section where the tickets was. I was crying, number one, uh, tears of joy, uh, for uh, I have been in the struggle. I remember uh, Mega Evers being shot, and uh, a group in Great Neck, Manhasset, I lived in Roslyn at that time, a group of uh, uh, whites had got together. We were serving on the Urban Renewal Board under Saul Walker who was the uh, supervisor for the Tyler North Hill And became chief judge of the state. And uh, asked that, did I want to go? I was president of the local chapter, the NAACP, mm -hmm. uh, in Great Neck. And I said yes. And I had a chance to fly to Mississippi uh, with Roy Wilkins. Uh, and uh, they are both deceased now. And uh, I uh, went to Mississippi and walked the streets. And that was my first encounter of feeling angry. Okay, now, now put yourself last week. What was your feelings, and how did you get there? Well, first of all, because uh, my your feelings. My feelings. Well, I'm like Roscoe. I was there in '63, and don't forget, I was born in Montgomery, Alabama. So I personally knew Mrs. Parks. We went to the same church. So all of that history in me bubbled out to see that all the work that I've been involved in, that Barack Obama could be standing, taking the oath of office as the president of the United States of America. You're giving me and guess pumps. what? Go ahead. I know that I played a real role in him being able to stand there. Thank you. Wendell. I thought of my mother who was denied the right to vote in Alabama because she was black. And you were born? I was born in Alabama, a few miles from where Hazel was born. Okay. And uh, I thought of all the indignities, all the cruelties, the lynchings, and all of those things we suffered under. I thought I, my mind went back to the, fact, to the fact that whites had schools and buses and books, and we walked to school and used their books after they were finished. I, rem I thought of my march from Selma to Montgomery. You were in that rain a day. Wow. And I thought of the two marches from Martin Luther King to Washington, D.C. Wow. And I thought of the time that I brought Dr. King to New York to speak three times. And the last time he said, Brother Foster, it's going to change. Because he could see I was disgusted and angry. I thought of Nelson Mandela and how he greeted us after we organized the National, African National Congress over here. And I thought of Julius Nyerere and, and even Abdul Nasser. Uh, all the men who really fought for what we achieved last Tuesday. And then as I sat there and saw this man, and remember that the New York Times said I was the oldest delegate from New York State, and asked how did I manage it, I said I just kept on living. <laughs> <laughs> and then my daughter was, and I were the only father-daughter delegate, and I, I looked at her and I said, now, her grandmother could not vote, mm -hmm. and yet in New York State they elected her secretary of the Electoral College. 
and all that went through my mind. Wow. A, a change in the church was saying a change is going to come. And, and uh, that's what came through my mind. Okay, how much has it changed? I mean, I grew up, I remember as an eight-year-old, my mother taking me down to Washington, D.C., and Virginia, and seeing a coloreds-only water fountain, which mm -hmm. I asked my mother, and my mother was a sophisticated New Yorker, an adult, didn't quite get it either. I mean, she had black friends, and it was really shocking. I mean, that's that's just a white Italian kid from Queens sort of getting that taste, let alone your but I, lives. But, but I had to live it. Right. <laughs> exactly. I had to live it as a child. That's what I'm saying. I so had to we go with my mom and dad to a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Hard-working people. My dad was a Pullman porter. They had to go to the bus and give their nickel to the bus driver if one white person was sitting on that bus and go in the back door. At that time, being a child, I didn't really understand what was going on. But getting back to Reverend Foster about the books, I remember passing several schools. And in my books, when we got it, it was in the walk to school to Alabama State. They would pass kids saying, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch your nigga by his toe. If he holler, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And then go and open your book, and nigga was wrote all over that. But we had teachers that told me that sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm. And from my Sunday school teacher in that, I was able, we had one frog in my biology class, one frog. We dissect that frog until that frog can be dissected no more. And out of my high school class come Fred Gray, who was a who's a great civil rights attorney, who now is in Tuskegee, Six, Alabama. There's five doctors out of my class. So at that time, African American Negroes and niggers, as they called us, was in their mind that we would reach the promised land. And then when Dr. King came along and said to us, started talking about nonviolence. Now, I was never in a fight with white people, although I don't know why, because I was a, a little uh, terror growing uh, up. Excuse me, I mean, you can't tell this now? Mm -hmm. I don't know why I never beat up white people. <laughs> nice! But it's something I had I, Charles Barron threaten to slap me on this show, and now what? Okay, so I never had a, the fight, and so when I heard Dr. King talk about uh, 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 that how we would do this to win where we are today, I am glad that I came through that era of believing. I, I joined Reverend Fossey Ooh, in that. Excellent. You know, I, but go Roscoe ahead. And I, Roscoe, and I want to, go ahead. Roscoe and I served as co-chairman of Jesse Jackson's campaign in, in the Bronx. And even, in 84. Yeah, and even we're roommates in San Francisco. For we the knew, convention. Yeah, we knew that Jesse was not going to become president. We were working toward a, a goal. Yes. We knew mm -hmm. it would come one day. day right? Wow. Mm -hmm. And we did not try to deceive the people by saying he would become president. We, it was an idea, an opportunity to express ourselves. Remember what Percy Sutton said, the woman said on TV? Mm -hmm. Every time she mm -hmm. saw Jesse, she mm -hmm. said, we'd be winning. We'd be winning. We'd be winning. Right. And so we didn't, we, yes, we weren't going to win that time. I was in San Francisco to both uh, of the conventions. And we didn't know that we'd be winning. But we had a hope that we would be with it now. Did we know we would be alive when it happened? No, no we didn't. Aren't you happy? Yes, we, happy. That, that's what well, makes us talk, feel. Can you talk about, well, let, let me me put, comment on let that, me but put, then I want you to comment on the larger issue of race in America. Well, Go ahead. Well, let, let's put this in perspective. Well, this country was born as a racist country. Slavery was with us from the day this country was founded, and they came in 1619. It wasn't until 1776 that the white land owners were able to throw off the British yoke and have a constitution that said every man, and they meant men because it wasn't women, was free and could speak and have certain rights. And then we had to go until 1865 before slavery was removed, and the big issue at that time was abolition. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have a person as property. But even Lincoln felt that African Americans were inferior. Mm -hmm. It was only then, after the Civil War in Reconstruction, that uh, they found that Benjamin Banneker had designed Washington, <laughs> D.C., that Martin R. Delaney was one of the great physicians. Then we had great writers. And gradually, the understanding of the larger population of the abilities of blacks 
changed. At the same time, blacks have always organized Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, uh, working for their own freedom, for our own freedom. So we knew this day was coming. The question is, how long we would had, it be? Yeah. In my case, particularly with my political activity, I figured we would have an African-American vice president mm. before we would have an African-American president. Mm. And in fact, Colin Powell could have been either a presidential president. or a vice presidential candidate. 1996, so, he could have. What happens as people live and die, and as the world changes, the economic, some of the biases and behaviors of the past are, are thrown out. So here we have this brilliant man, African father, white American mother, with this great tradition of having been in Indonesia and uh, Honolulu and going to Columbia and then going to Harvard. It, the, and being a community organizer. And being oh, a I was just going to jump in. I was, I was right. a community organizer. Right. 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 Community because organizer. Put that in the there. words are right out of my mouth. The, the, the point we're making is that he became more accessible and acceptable to the general population because, as I frequently say, competence overcame ideology. Mm -hmm. The ideology of the Republicans about tax cuts and spreading the wealth and the greed. People in general didn't like that. And here we have this very beautifully spoken, competent man against somebody who was maybe a decent American, but it was totally incompetent. Right. And so as a result, 54% of Americans voted for Barack Obama, and that's why we have this change in our society. And the, even the press are not criticizing him as an African American, they're criticizing him or supporting him as a president because right. he has those skills. But I mean, he, in fact, he ran as a man running for the presidency who was black. As a man. Jackson was different. Jackson doesn't get enough credit here, mm. I think, in, oh, of in, course. The, in the narrative. Mm. But he ran as a black man. I mean, clearly he ran on, mm. on issues that transcended race, but essentially mm. ran as a black man. Now, you've got Obama. What, what does it say about America's racial report card at this moment? Where are we and where might we go? Roscoe, and then we'll move it around. Well, the final exam isn't in yet. Of course. <laughs> and we'll all be dead a long this, time. This is, this is right, the we mid, understand. This is the this mid is the wedding. Right. No, this is the wedding, as Jesse said. The marriage haven't started yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll take it. This is the mid Whatever the metaphor and is. What, what do we have? We have two things. One, the image of African Americans as self. That self-image has risen up. You can see it. You can see it in the posture of people. see it in the smile. That's positive. The politics is much more difficult because still America is around money and property and status, and Obama can change some of that, but the Congress, the Congress really eventually makes those determinations. So he's way out in front. He's established several things he's going to do. He's worked beautifully in his first week. But the, and the transition. But the, uh, the final analysis will be when the final exam comes 200 years from now and the, or 100 years from now. And this is a multiracial society where people have opportunities regardless of their background. That hasn't happened yet. But I think it will happen. Have you seen it in, 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 the, in your churches? What has been the reaction of your parishioners, your congregants? Well, we have a, a, a policy in our church that we teach black history every Sunday. We go down to uh, Bethel Amy Church, the oldest black institution in America. Where is it? In Philadelphia, 6th and Lombard Street, where a former slave established the first indigenous religious body in America. We go there and we see where Harriet Tubman brought her slaves. We go there and we see where Daniel Payne escaped from South Carolina to walk to Green County, Ohio to start Wilberforce University. And then we go to Mother Zion Church here in Harlem. And there we see the writings of Frederick Douglass. We see the artifacts from Harriet Tubman and from Susanna Truth right on a, in Harlem so that, so that our kids can understand where, the, where we've come mm -hmm. from. They also are made to understand that uh, thoughts are things. And when you think that you can't make it, you can't. But we also teach one of the things, that handicaps need not handicap, nor limitations limit. We have seen Robeson overcome, our, our, uh, Mandela overcome. I met 29 different leaders of, in, African, in Africa that became a presidents, and I, they, they overcame. I, I, they, we, we teach our kids that they can overcome. Racism is still alive in America. It's, it's, it's still alive in New York City. It's, it's very much alive, and it's healthy, but we still believe, as Hazel said, these things don't hold us back. 
these things. My mother could not vote. And when I, when I, I cried, when I looked at my daughter, who, her granddaughter, the uh, uh, secretary of the Electoral College for New York State, that, that, that moved me. And, and I, I, I see in, in the kids that are going to school now, in spite of the uh, uh, differences in the schools in our neighborhood, and giving us the poorest teachers, the newest teachers, our kids are still achieving. I, I, I see where the TV and newspaper will spotlight a, a, a black boy or girl that's in trouble. But when we had a funeral a few weeks ago of a kid that was 16 that dropped dead at the gymnasium practicing, when more than 4,000 young people stood on the street corner to celebrate that boy's life, no TV camera was there, no newspaper was there because it was not news. When mm -hmm. we called uh, the eight news, they said, well, that's not news. The police came thinking there was a riot to arrest kids that came <laughs> simply to pay respect for one of their yeah, colleagues mm -hmm. because they're so accustomed to that. Uh, I, I see uh, racism alive in New York City when I am leaving my church on a Sunday and I'm stopped by a policeman and I, I'm ordered, boy, get out of the car. Still? I, yeah, still. Uh, and, and then when the policeman see who I am, uh, and this happened when I was in the city council, then he saw my city council badge and dropped it on the ground so, uh, so that I would have to suit down Oof. and get it. Uh, these things are still alive. And when we, when we say they are, they say we are alarmist. <laughs> uh, I, I look at my hero here, mm -hmm. uh, my colleague, my roommate. When people, we try to tell them about what they've done. He's been to speak to the kids. When my daughter will hold, uh, as a city council, will have a youth forum with over 500 children there. We can't get the press. We let one child break a window, <laughs> mm. and, and the press is there. Mm. So racism is still alive. It's born. When I pick up the New York Times, I will see where two men and a Negro were arrested, or a black man was arrested. They still separate us from other human beings. On TV, it's the same thing. It's very much alive. So it's still there. It's still there, but we have to overcome it. Let me are. turn to you, Hazel. For well, a I said. This, wait, wait, but this may sound sexist. I think one of the real stars, there were certain moments in the, in the inauguration that froze you. And one of them, I have to tell you, was Aretha Franklin when she comes out and sings My Country Tis of Thee, because I had watched the King's speech the day before and he <laughs> talked about it. But Michelle Obama, she's standing there, but she gives a little glance to her kids because she's watching out for her kids. And that told me this woman's really got it mm -hmm. together. She's hip, she's smart. Talk about, talk about Michelle Obama. Well, Michelle Obama is, uh, is a class into herself. Self. And they're trying to say that, you know, she's in the tradition of, of Jackie O. No, Michelle is in the tradition of the Robinson family. Mm -hmm. uh, the Robinson family, when you read that story about that mother and mm -hmm. that father mm -hmm. and the mom staying home to make sure that the children was in school, you read that Michelle was reading uh, at age four. Uh, she is a Michelle made in the image of African American strong women. But, but she's hip. She's hip. She she absolutely Come she's on. hip. She's hip because but she understands her role. She understands that those two precious children need the protection. They need the, the the guidance of her mother. And she said, "I'll go out in the day, but I want to be home at night. I'll only spend one night out." Uh, of the house from the children. She brought grandmother in. That's yep. the history of us. This is good. That's the but, history but of us. And grandmother comes in. And grandmother, she's showing what the African-American family, those of us who have grounded family, mm -hmm. it was because grandmother and grandfather and aunt and uncle all was surrounded. As her brother said when he introduced her, I was there in, 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 uh, when her brother introduced her tonight on the stage. And he said, you know, we come from a family tradition. And Obama said it himself. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's what sure. invited him. And, 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 he had not had the kind of family that uh, uh, Michelle has had. Sure. So he, when her dad took him on that basketball court, you know, mm -hmm. he didn't take him out just to see how could, could that boy uh, shoot a hoop. He took him out to see where's your strength, mm -hmm. where's your manhood, because that's what I've given this daughter of mine. Okay, good, excellent. And so when we, we, we saw we, that, but let uh, me tell you, follow back on Roscoe, what I said to the Daily, uh, to Newsday. I said to them that Obama transcends. You see, white America is hurting just as much as African Americans. So race got out of their mind for what Bush had done to them. And they saw somebody who was going in a different direction. So as Dr. Brown has said, that the old racism is dead. 
And so the young people that got involved in Obama uh, a campaign was young people who wasn't thinking about race. They was thinking about, am I going to be able to pay my college tuition? Am I going to be able to go to school? What about the loans I already have? I'm going to be losing my job because half of them hadn't been already gone off the job set. So he transcend race on issues of economics. Okay. Uh, Reverend. What Hazel was saying about the mothers, white mothers, taking care of their kids after school and before school. Our mothers were in white kitchens washing their clothes. And, 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 and I remember when I taught school in, in uh, North Carolina where black kids had to buy their books and the white kids were given books. And the books, I remember teaching a class where C Christopher Columbus was talking to Queen Isabella, turned the page, and he's eating corn with Indians in America. The white kids tore, had torn the pages out and we got their leftover books. So we've overcome a great deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, Baram, uh, Barack Obama represents not only the present, but the future, but the future. And, 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 and it's because of people like my hero, Dr. Brown and others, and Paul Ropes and, and, and Malcolm. And, 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 and what we do, we try to point back to them and say, hey, they, they overcame. Mm -hmm. and, see, and you can overcome. You got another, the last word, Roscoe. There's another part of this. There's more responsibility now in the black community. We really don't have the excuse that we've been beaten up just because of our race. Mm -hmm. We have opportunities. We've got to work hard. We've got to be disciplined. We've got to go to school. We've got to strive for excellence. And we have to realize in this world, 80% of the people are people of color. So we're going to be this multiracial, this multi-ethnic mosaic that Dave Dink has talked about. Right. And that's what America's going to be. It's going to be a place that's more like the rest of the world. Thank White you. people must uh, adapt themselves to, un uh, uh, to understand that what he said, the majority of people in the world are non-Caucasian. Be careful how you treat people. You've got the last word, gentlemen. <laughs> Hazel, thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Roscoe, thank you. as always, a okay. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.